Uh, good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices uh, as they interfere with the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members will refer to tablets during the course of the meeting. Uh, that's because we provide papers in digital format. Uh, agenda item one today um, is on Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. This is our eighth oral evidence session on this bill. Uh, today we are taking evidence from witnesses from local authority licensing uh, bodies in relation to general licensing provision. Uh, before we start, can I point out that witnesses don't need to press the buttons on their microphones. They will be operated by the sound engineer. And I'd like to welcome Andrew Mitchell, Community Safety Manager, City of Edinburgh Council, and Peter Smith, Senior Licensing Officer, Glasgow City Council. Uh, gentlemen, would you like to make uh, any opening remarks? And maybe um, uh, in those opening remarks, you could tell us a little bit about your, your jobs. Uh, Mr Smith. Well... First of all, um, on behalf of Glasgow City Council, I'd like to extend our thanks once again to being invited along to give evidence to the committee. Um, my role within uh, the council's licensing team is to oversee essentially the service delivery aspect of the, the business um, to ensure that we are delivering the, the correct level of service to our customers and to our, our communities. Um, in terms of the, the bill and the proposals contained within that bill, the council as we've, we've outlined in previous evidence sessions, is supportive of those proposals in and of themselves. But we do caveat that or qualify that by, again, raising the issue that we believe that the licensing system, in particular the 82 Act, um, is not fit for purpose as it stands, and that um, consolidation or indeed a, a revision of the Act altogether is required in order to improve the, the level of licensing service that's been delivered to the the businesses and to the communities um, that we're serving. And in terms of your, your role, mm -hmm. uh, Mr Smith? Yes. In terms of my role, so I, I oversee um, service delivery within uh, the licensing session, so that's dealing with both the, the legal aspect of the business and the actual operational side of the business in terms of dealing with agents and businesses, ensuring the applications are processed uh, timidly and that the, the legal processes and the administrative processes within that role are fulfilled by the team. Thank you. Mr Mitchell, please. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me along. I'm the Council's Community Safety Manager. I have responsibility for the Council's licensing functions from policy through to the administration of how we process applications. I'm also responsible for Council's regulatory functions which deal with licensed premises, including managing the licensing standards officers. I think, in common with my colleague, the City of Edinburgh welcomes broadly what's in the bill, but we take a similar view that the 1982 Act probably has passed its sell-by date, and there are quite a few other bits of legislation out there that deals with licensing that need tidied up and brought into, we think, a consolidated Act. We, the main issues for us, I think you're particularly interested in the training of private hire car drivers, which we think quite essential. We also are quite concerned about the provisions in the 2005 Act relating to occasional premises. I'm happy to go through any sort of detail which would help the committee in that particular regard, but generally broadly supportive of what is in the Act and as far as it goes. Okay, thank you. Uh, you've both said that uh, the 82 Act is maybe outdated and not fit for purpose anymore. Uh, would you like to, to point out to us what the, the main flaws are in that piece of legislation now and how you think that the uh, proposed new bill will resolve some of those difficulties? Mr Smith, first, please. Well, I think we have to, to begin by looking at the fact that the 82 Act was drafted over 30 years ago um, and it deals with a, a variety of different activities which require to be regulated from very obvious things such as taxing private hire through to the more obscure such as window cleaners or, or boat hire licences. Um, the Act has served its purpose over the years, but as Scotland has moved on, as business has changed, the, the provisions in the Act haven't kept pace with that. Um, the 2005 Act presents probably the benchmark for how licensing should work in our 21st century Scotland. Um, and when you compare the two, the 82 Act is, is deficient in, in several areas. The lack of 
licensing objectives is a, a major concern within the 82 Act. Um, we are charged with granting licences, we are charged with setting conditions, but those conditions don't go as far as to place objectives onto licence holders. So we may condition a licence to, um, for example, with, with scrap metal dealers, we, we may be given the power to condition licence so that they're non-cash payments, but that isn't backed up by a requirement for the licence holder to meet objectives such as preventing crime and disorder or securing public safety. And it, it, it gets into the, the technical minutia of how the two acts work, but those lack of objectives are a major concern for us moving forward when the, the 2005 Act creates an expectation of how licensing authorities should be dealing with businesses and we don't have the same powers under the 82 Act. And then when we look at specific provisions within the 82 Act, for example, street trading, which was drafted in 82 to deal with burger vans, people at football matches selling hats, scarves and badges. In a 21st century Scotland, we're having to use that legislation to regulate everything from uh, car washes to pedicabs. And it's clear that the Act was never intended to regulate those activities. And we, we're trying to work with legislation that's not intended to deal with those activities. And as we continue to move on, it becomes more and more apparent that the Act is just not suitable for do, dealing with those types of things. Thank you. Mr Mitchell, please. I think when I give the committee maybe an example of what the, the public would think, so in terms of legislation moving on under the 2005 Act and under planning legislation, there's quite a sophisticated system of neighbour notifications but there is no equivalent in the 1982 Act. So one of the most common complaints we get from residents and members of the public is that premises spring up beside them and there's very little chance for them to be aware that a premise is likely to be applying for a licence before it opens. So if you take examples like that, you can see how the 1982 Act 30 years ago now, when compared to other pieces of legislation, has fallen well behind what you would expect to involve the public in terms of being aware that's what's going on in their community. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I, I maybe ask you what you consider to be the advantages uh, and disadvantages of creating uh, a new civic licensing standards officer role, Mr. Smith? I think the, the advantage is that it, it creates a, a single point of contact for communities who have concerns with activities which are licensed under the 82 Act. At the moment, there are officers within the council spread across different teams, training standards, environmental health, etc., who will deal with certain aspects of certain activities regulated under the Act. There is no single point of contact for someone who has an issue with a licensed premises. So creating the, the role, I think, is helpful for dealing with that specific issue. Though in reality, I wouldn't be confident that every local authority would create a specific role for of a licensing standards officer for civic licensing. It may be that that responsibility would simply be divided up and given to <coughs> the different officers that deal with different aspects of licensing at the moment. So an environmental health officer may also be an environmental health officer and a civic licensing officer, rather than creating an individual position. But I think unless the provisions are put in place, we won't know if that will happen. In terms of the, the disadvantages, I think that it, the creation of this officer creates an expectation that there would be someone in the council who could deal with issues <coughs> in relation to licensed premises. The reality is that the officer wouldn't be able to do that. The officer would be charged with dealing with breaches of license conditions. Because there's no objectives under the 82 Act, if the premises is creating public nuisance in and of itself, that would not be something that a civic officer could deal with. They could only deal with a specific breach of a specific condition within the Act because there's no overriding objectives to which the business has to be adhering to. So I think there are advantages in creating the role to give communities comfort that there's someone that they can contact. But at the same time, I'm concerned that it may create a level of expectation that the local authority can deal with issues which it's not charged with dealing with. And I suppose I, I need to give an example to sort of contextualise that. So if you take, um, for example, the idea that a street trader suddenly springs up outside your front door with a burger van, the civic officer could deal with a breach of that street trader's 
conditions, but they couldn't deal with the fact that the community don't want that street trader to be there or that that street trader is creating public nuisance because there's no objective to tie that to. They could only deal with the actual physical license conditions, which should be structured such as do they have, a, do they have suitable bins for any waste that they're producing or are they operating within the terms of the license? So I have mixed feelings about the creation of this officer. Overall, I think it's good, but I think in the context of the 82 Act, there are, there are flaws. So basically what you're saying is that the perception of the public will be, uh, yes, we have these new officers, uh, but uh, they're not going to be able to deliver what we want. Is that what you're saying? They will deliver certain aspects of what people want, but they won't be able to deliver the overall service I think the public would expect that officer to be able to deliver. But they'll be able to help the public and guide the public yes, uh, into absolutely. dealing with objecting to uh, licences in the future? Yes. For the burger van in specific place or whatever it may be? Well, not the burger van because, <clears throat> unfortunately, with the 82 Act, there's very little chance the community would know that the burger van was going to turn up before the licence was granted. Under the new provisions? Under the new provisions, they will know, be more likely to know about licence application I of the, said burger van. I think there's a potential they may be more likely to know, but I wouldn't say it was it was guaranteed under the provisions. I think that it's it's still coming back to what the officer will actually be able to do compared to what the expectation of what the officer will able to be able to do. So we might be boosting the the public confidence in all of this only to dash their confidence when this becomes a reality. I think that's very well put. Okay. Uh, Mr Mitchell. I think local authorities across the piece will take a different view on license, civil licensing standards officers. I think the smaller authorities might just struggle to find the resources to create the real. Um, my own authority, we've tried to put all the expertise for dealing with it under one team and it's quite likely that we would just assign an existing officer, say like an environmental health officer, to carry out these particular functions. I think it's important that the the Act does envisage a mediation role, which in reality most local authorities are currently doing in order to try and resolve difficulties between the public and licence holders. But I do think, like my colleague, there is I don't think the, the officer in itself will create, will solve every problem under the 82 Act. And I think if you go back to my point about neighbour notification, I think it's highly unlikely that the, the officer as created will resolve that difficulty in any great, to any great extent. OK, thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed. I was interested in the burger van, not per, per se, but who would actually deal with it? Would the people phone the police rather than to say, can we get rid of this van if it's outside the house or if it's causing a nuisance? Who would actually, or what party would actually be dealing with it? That's what I was really... There, there, is, there is no party. Right. This, this is a, a, one of the fundamental flaws of the 82 Act. Once the licence is granted, unless it's a breach of condition or unless it's a, a criminal matter that you can involve the police with, then there's no route for communities to say, this is a public nuisance, we want the committee to reconsider whether this application should be granted. If it was, for example, food smells, we could ask environmental health to look at it from that specific aspect, or if a breach of conditions, that specific aspect. But the overarching idea that if a licence is creating public nuisance can be dealt with, it can't. Under the 82 Act, there's no provision to deal with that. This bill is going to actually um, uh, close that loophole? No. You would, you would have to go back to the beginning and look at the 82 Act fundamentally before you could really address those issues. And I think if you'd done that, you would probably, in the end, create something which is much more like the 2005 Act, where many of the activities regulated under 82 could move to, to a model like the 2005 Act or even become part of the 2005 Act, and you would have a system more in line with the operation in England and Wales, where a premises is licensed under one licence, which is licensing multiple activities, and that's tied into a sensible level level of objectives that both the, the licence holder and the local authority are tied to ensuring. Without that, these problems will continue. If we continue with this Act, these problems will continue. Mr. Mitchell, Thank you. To to that? I think in practical terms, I mean, taking that example, 
the only realistic opportunity the community ha would have is when the licence comes up for renewal. If they become aware of the renewal, and that's a big if, they could then seek to object at that point. But unless, if the operation has been there for the previous year or however long, without any real problems, without any breach of conditions, it's, I would have thought unlikely that even at the renewal stage, the, the committee would take a view that it would be inappropriate. Thank you. John Wilson. John Wilson. <coughs> Thank you very much, Convener. Just based on the responses we've heard there, what would be required to be included in the new legislation that would satisfy the local authorities, Edinburgh and Glasgow, and potentially other authorities throughout Scotland, to ensure that what we're actually doing is delivering the expectation of the public and making that reality? Because what I'm hearing at the present moment is that, and what I picked up from you, Mr Smith, is that the current, even the pr proposed bill does not go far enough to meet the expectations that we may be building up, as the convener said, in the public, public expectation. So what do we need to do to actually ensure we actually meet those expectations? Mr Smith. It would be substantial. I, I, I would I'd almost be teetering on the brink of saying I don't think you could implement through this bill enough amendments to address those issues. It is fundamentally that the 82 Act has been in place for 30 years. It's served its purpose. It's had its time. We, it needs to go back and be rebuilt from the ground up in line with the 2005 Act, which is setting out an entirely different framework for how we approach licensing. And I think that if you try to implement the type of provisions that you would have to put into the 82 Act to implement objectives, to implement um, the removal of fixed term licences and implement the sort of the review procedures which are missing so that people can bring issues to to the local authority any time to implement annual fee proposals instead of the, the three year fixed renewals, all the things which are exist in the two thousand five Act within the eighty two Act, it would be so substantive that you would you would almost be writing a new piece of legislation in doing that, which is why I would really say you have to go right back to the, the beginning and start again with the eighty two Act to actually implement something which is fit for purpose for a modern Scotland. Mr Mitchell? I certainly agree, and certainly the Edinburgh Council's view was that introducing a form of the licensing objectives would be essential if you were going to retain the 1982 Act. I, I think I do take the view that the 82 Act has been amended that many times that it comes a question of how many times you can keep amending it. But again, just to give you an example of how far behind other bits of legislation the 92 Act is and how it hampers local authorities dealing with problems. You can revoke a licence under liquor, you can revoke an HMO licence, you can even revoke a sex shop licence under the 82 Act, but there is no power under the 82 Act to revoke a licence. A, a council can suspend for the unexpired portion, but even that kind of simple saying, this is a problem or the applicant as serious misconduct, there is no power under the 82 Act to revoke a licence, which is fairly fundamental in terms of licensing, and it just shows you how far the 82 Act has drifted behind other pieces of legislation. OK. Willie Coffey, you're desperate to get in there. Uh, thanks very much, Kadir. I was just on this issue about the burger vans and where they can and can't operate. I mean, my, my understanding of um, East Ayrshire Council's, uh, my own authority, is that they apply conditions to, to where uh, things like burger vans can operate and, for example, they don't permit them within a certain distance of schools, for example. So is the solution to that not within the conditions that the local authority can apply to, to prevent things like that, for example, happening from setting up outside someone's front door or window? So they, they do have the powers within the conditions that they set to be a bit more prescriptive about where exactly they can operate. Uh, Mr Smith? Um, I suppose the answer is maybe yes and no. Um, conditions have applied to a licence once it's granted, so they control the operation. The, the local authority could set policies around not wanting licences to be granted near schools or not wanting to be granted near particular establishments. Um, how legally sound those policies are is open to debate. Um, I think as well you have to remember that the street trade is a very good example of where... Eight. How many times have you faced challenges in Glasgow in terms of some of those policies? 
um, over 30 years, uh, not an exact number, but um, hundreds of times, yes, certainly, um, in respect to some policies, some conditions. Um, street trading serves a, a, a good example of where street trading is, is four paragraphs in the 82 Act. There are not two authorities in Scotland that approach street trading in the same way. Some license them on mobile basis, some license them in localities, some license on specific locations, um, some license individuals, some license businesses. It's an, it's an incredible mix. And for traders who are operating across Scotland, they face multiple different licensing regimes just to, just to operate. Um, conditions can tackle some of the issues, policy can tackle some of the issues, but it's entirely conceivable that someone can come in and apply for a licence which won't fall within policies. The consultation might just be with the police and no one else, and then the licence will go through, the licence will be granted, and then suddenly that business will start to operate. And at that point, the community will then say, why, why is this business being licensed? And for street trading, you can insert any of the activities that we deal with under, under the 82 Act. Um, and they really have no mechanism to then take that licence away if it's causing a problem, unless it's a matter of criminality or it's a breach of a specific condition. And that is not analogous with the powers that we have under the 2005 Act, which give, us, give communities and the police and local stand, licensing standards officers powers under the review procedures to bring an issue to the licensing board at any time, whether, whether it's a breach of conditions or a breach of the licensing objectives. Why would you want to remove a licence unless there was a breach of conditions anyway? Well, it, it's the issue of, of, of public nuisance. If a, a community doesn't want a, a licence that's granted to be in force, if that's causing definable public nuisance, then I think it's right that communities should be given the power to bring that matter to licensing authorities and allow licensing authorities to make those decisions. And the, the simple fact of the matter is that communities at the moment don't have that power. But they would have that power under the 2005 Act in respect of liquor licence premises. I like playing devil's advocate at this committee. Um, a number of years ago, my father had an ice cream van, uh, which obviously uh, was uh, dealt with under the Licensing Act. Um, it served uh, a number of communities which were defined in the licence. Um, there was one or two individuals who didn't want an ice cream van in their particular area. Um, so they would report time and time and time again uh, about breach of conditions of uh, use of um, chimes uh, in a van that didn't actually have any chimes. Um, so, you know, um, I, I would like to... Uh, to, to, to get an idea from you, how many times um, there are complaints about licences from individuals which maybe don't reflect the views of entire communities uh, on that particular licence? Thank you. The, the lack of a, a review process within the 82 Act means that we don't deal with that many complaints in relation to licensed premises because at the initial inquiry they realise there's nothing that we can do. Um, but we will deal with objections on a regular basis through the application process. Probably maybe 10 per cent of uh, licence applications will, will garner some form of, of objection to them. I think the, the point is that the, the process allows those individuals to bring the matter to the licensing authority and the licensing authority to, to deal with that issue. So if it's, a, if it's an individual that's not representing a community, then the licensing authority can establish that through the application process and, and determine not to, to attach a relevant amount of weight to that. If we had the review process that we have under the 82 Act, there would be the ability within that to then treat repeated complainers as frivolous and vexatious and not have to continually deal with them. So again, I think that's an example of where the 82 Act doesn't have the robust provisions of the 2005 Act to deal with repeat complainers in an effective way. So that it's of course important to balance both sides. Communities need to have a route to raise issues about license holders and licensed activities. But effective legislation will also have measures in that to ensure that where they are repeated or vexatious or being raised by one individual and not representative of a community, that that can be established and appropriate mechanisms can be put in place to ensure that 
that can be addressed. And we have that broadly within the 2005 Act. We have no equivalent provisions within the 82 Act. Mitchell, please. I think, and certainly our local experiences, we would receive quite a large volume of complaints about businesses who are licensed and how they interact with individuals. And it can be quite difficult for the licensing authority, I suppose, to come to a view of in what sense somebody's individual grievance with a particular licence, who they happen to be, for example, living next door or living above a particular premise, at what point that becomes representative of a wider community concern about a, an individual licensed premise having a wider impact to the community. I mean, the, the grounds for refusing under the Act, which in essence are really the grounds at which you could consider taking action, for example, suspension, are fairly limited and are fairly, it's a fairly high standard. Certainly, I mean, I, I welcome the introduction of the role of mediation under the Civil Licensing Standards Officer as a way of trying resolving some of them. I don't, don't think it will resolve all of them, but it, it at least gives us a formal route similar to what the LSOs use under the 2005 Act to try and mediate between uh, individuals and licensed premises. And what, what licensed premises are most of these complaints about? Would it be hot food takeaways, for example? That, that can be quite top but again if I just give you an example we use the street trading provisions to license pedicabs which individual pedicabs are not a particular issue but it's now we have a problem in the city that the volume of them how they operate at night where they operate at night is causing significant community concern and we're struggling now to use the powers available in the 82 Act to control I suppose the, the impact collectively of these licences because each individual licence holder may be creating a, a technical breach of the Act but it's the cumulative impact if you, you go down certain streets in Edinburgh at night you'll see a, a congregation of these pedicabs blocking the, the pavements etc and it's that kind of issue that the 82 Act is not particularly adept at dealing with OK uh, Interesting um, in terms of uh, complaints, and uh, I, I, this is really being devil's advocate here, how many times do you find that somebody moves into a community new and then starts moaning about the the, the licence that's in place? Buys a, a house up above a, a Chinese takeaway, for example, and suddenly starts moaning about, uh, about noxious smells. Um, I, I give that example because uh, many years ago I had a, a woman who uh, moved into a house in my old council ward and the house was next to a playground and then she started a campaign to remove the playground. Um, Mr Smith? I, I would say that more often than not it, it's, it's the other way around. It's um, community councils, it's established residents who will be complaining about new licensed activity that springs up in their area. Yes, the, the, uh, if you bring any uh, licensing authority to the table, we will have examples like that of where someone will, will move into an area and then they will complain about that area. And there may be a part of you that thinks, well, the, the businesses were clearly there beforehand, so it should, perhaps shouldn't come as a surprise. But overall, my experience is that, that complaints will come from residents, from community councils, from people who have lived in an area for a long time, and it will be in relation to new activities which are springing up. And because of the lack of community engagement, because the, the Act doesn't really empower communities to, to shape um, around licensing, um, by the time th these issues spring up, um, we're not really empowered to do anything about that. Mr Mitchell? I think we would recognise a similar pattern, but we do have issues. For example, it's quite topical for us at present, the impact of live music and for both premises licensed under the 82 Act and the 2005 Act, if you're a, a neighbour, you know, what impact noise has if you're in a residential premises and, you know, the, the promoters of music have raised concerns with the council along that lines of, you know, the venues long established has been there for many years and often they find that the people complaining have moved into the area after the venue has been long established. So that we do recognise in, in some circumstances that, that the pattern which the convener outlined is, you know, is there in our city. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Uh, could I just take up Mr Mitchell this thing about pedicabs without going into too much detail? I mean, who are you licensing? Are you licensing the cab or the driver? And are there many problems with it? I'm, they, they seem to be prevalent in Edinburgh. Are they in, prevalent in other cities that you know of? We, this, we haven't come across pedicabs particularly before. So, so for pedicabs, we're using the street trading provisions, and I, I know Glasgow takes a, a quite different approach to what we take, but we are licensing both the operator and the individual pedicab drivers, for want of a, a, a better description. And the, the issue for us, I suppose, is the, the volume of them. We now have several hundred operating in the city. Um, the standards of behaviour, I think some of the operators have recently been called to the licensing subcommittee to discuss the, the standards of behaviour of the drivers, you know, blocking pavements. There's a zone where they're supposed to operate in the city, uh, roughly speaking, the, the World Heritage Site map, and you know, often you'll find them outside that zone, which is a clear breach of their condition, but they're going where, I suppose, the, the market takes them. Thank you. And are you are, sorry? Are you limiting the the amount of pedicabs? Or I mean, they seem to be providing a service. I've not used them myself, but I, I think we uh, we take the view there's no power to limit them. So the issue is how we then manage what we currently have. Thank you. John Wilson, please. Thank you, convener. Just on the issue and using the example of the burger van, van and under planning legislation, there's the statutory consultee in terms of community councils. I would be notified if there was a, you know, a planning application submitted and being considered by the council. Uh, and neighbours within a certain distance would be notified uh, that that license or the change to planning uh, was taking place. Would you see any value in that type of neighbour notification or statutory consultee condition applying to the issuing of licences? Uh, for instance, for burger vans in particular areas? Mr Mitchell. Sir, I, I think it's worth exploring. I think there's a bit about how you administer it and how logistics, but leaving that aside, if you take the burger van as an example, as an authority, we would advise the police of an application as a courtesy, we'd tell elected members and community councils, even though we're not actually under a statutory obligation to do so. And then... Beyond that, if you're a member of the public who happens to be beside, living beside this burger van, unless you check our online registers or happen to see the site notice, there would be no way, really, of you knowing that that application was being considered up until the point it was granted and the burger van became a reality in your street. I would absolutely I agree with my, my colleague's comments on that. I think we would, we would welcome... Um, some statutory requirements to, in, to ensure that community councils, local elected members are engaged. Um, the the neighbourhood notification process is very technical, very complicated, but again, if, if there's such a provision to do that, then we, we can make that, that work. Um, they would certainly help to add towards the, the engagement piece, um, and that would help within the, the application process, but of course it doesn't address the other side, which is once the licence is is granted, there's not really um, much in the way of powers to deal with it after that. Okay. Um, Willie Coffey, please. On that point again, please, uh, convener. Um, but in, in the neighbour notification issue, where there may be a, a radius, for example, where neighbours within that radius must be notified, there's nothing preventing the authority from notifying people out with that. Radius, and that, that's a common fault to the, the, in complaints that I receive, even as a, an MSP, that people five steps over the line got no notification. Surely the local authorities are empowered to, to decide to extend the notification to people whom they may decide may be impacted <coughs> by a new shop or some kind of facility. So you don't need a, an amendment to the Act to enable that. You can just, by discretion, decide that neighbours will be impacted and so notify. Is that, is that your understanding? Mr Smith first, please. I, I would say that our, our solicitors would, would shift uncomfortably with that suggestion. Um, they, always? <laughs> they, they, they can be reasonable sometimes, but um, in, in terms of, of that specific issue, um, we're always conscious that, that we have to, to work within the lines of the legislation and where we might say it would be quite reasonable to go out with those, those lines, we run the risk of then seeking objections and, and, and overstepping our boundary as 
uh, a body which is dealing with an application in an open, transparent way, um, if we go seeking objections, does that then um, you know, taint that? A little bit further, seeking objections. If I hark back to my days as a councillor, and I'm sure others uh, who have served in councils around this table as well, mm -hmm. there have been times where we have probably uh, decided to tell uh, large swathes of areas uh, about applications that have come in. Uh, not saying to folk one way or the other what they should do or whether they should object or not object, but letting them know that that's happening. What's so wrong with that? Well, I'm looking at it from the perspective of the licensing authority. And the licensing authority has given legislation which instructs it on what it should do. And to go beyond what it should do has to be assessed as whether or not the authority is seeking those objections. Obviously, if we pass that to the, the local members for the ward, they can take that matter. Yes, we pass it to the, to the members, to the community councils in some instances, and they can take those issues further. But if we are given legislation that says only consult within four metres, and we, for some applications, say, well, let's take that to five metres, then as these, these, these uncomfortably shifting solicitors would say that's, that's, that's overstepping the mark and seeking, seeking objections. Uh, Mr Mitchell. I, I suppose, um, notwithstanding any legal issues, if you go back to the 82 Act, there is no mechanism in the 82 Act for neighbour notification. So local authorities, if they were to do it, would be doing so entirely voluntary, and the biggest barrier will be cost. You would have to find the staff to work out which premises to notify, prepare the letter, send them out at cost. Pick it again, in terms of cost. If you actually notified further, do you think that it may save on complaints in the long run and officer time, and it may actually save you a great deal of money uh, to, to extend rather than not to? So in terms of 82, it's not a question of the notifying further. It's a question there is no neighbour notification under the 82 Act at present. Um, but in answer to your direct point, convener, in my experience, the more you make people aware of these premises, the more likely you are to get complaints and objections. That's my experience. At, at the beginning? Yeah. At any point in the process, if you advertise that an application is pending or a, a renewal is pending, I suspect you would get... I mean, I give, give the convener an example. We have HMOs, which is not part of the 82 Act, but we have people who have been complaining about individual HMOs for 10 years in a row. Um, so they, they complain year after year after year, despite the fact that the committee has heard their complaints and ruled on them. So I, sus I think there's, I would certainly would advocate some form of neighbour notification because it would deal with some of the issues of the public being disengaged with the licensing system, but it, it would generate a volume of work. And back to Mr Coffey's point, I think that's probably the biggest barrier at present to local authorities choosing to do that. OK. Um, very briefly, because I want briefly, to move off this topic. Yeah, just briefly on that point, Mr Mitchell, the bill is presented in the financial memorandum says that the local authorities would be able to recover through licensing fees any costs associated with the applications. Surely in the situation that you outlined, then any additional costs in terms of consultation would be or could be recovered through the application process. Mr Mitchell. Absolutely. I mean, that's where the costs would go back, and then those in turn would translate as a cost on business, because it's the applicants who are paying the fees who would then pay additional fees in order to pay for the neighbour notification. Mr Smith, anything to add to that? Um, I, I would just add, that from Glasgow's perspective, if, if Minister or the, the, the committee were to um, place neighbour notification requirements on um, the authority, we would we would implement those, we would engage with communities. I think that would help to, to make them aware of that. The, the costs would be passed to business, but the Act is structured in such a way that that, that is the model for it to work. So if it's the, the will of the, the, the committee that we, we should do, the, do this, then we're absolutely able to do that. Okay. Uh, COSLA has uh, suggested that uh, licensing standards officers uh, be given additional enforcement powers uh, under the Gambling Act 2005. Do you think that would be helpful, Mr Smith? I wouldn't find that incredibly helpful at all. Um, the, 
the Gambling Act in, in Scotland, uh, obviously the Gambling Act is a UK-wide piece of legislation. There are certain regulations which are enacted to give local authorities in Scotland specific powers. Um, the regulations that were enacted to give local authorities the power to inspect licensing like uh, gambling premises um, weren't enacted correctly, and local authorities don't have any powers to inspect premises that offer gambling. So extending the remit of those officers to deal with gambling would be somewhat pointless, as we have no powers to inspect gambling premises in Scotland. Uh, because the, that's a, it's a because the Act was written uh, wrong. Yes, there's a misdrafting okay. one of the pieces of regulation. Thank you. Mr Mitchell, would you agree with that? I'm, I'm not sure how we got there, because I'm, I'm not particularly an expert in gambling, but I, I would say that we are finding that we are having to do the work, go out and check the premises, absent having explicit statutory power, so anything that could be done to address that would be useful. Uh, can I just, in terms of the 82 Act, point out there are some issues within the powers as it currently exists. So, for example, in relation to unlicensed premises, only the police have powers in relation to unlicensed premises. So if you're creating this new role, then I, I would suggest that that needs to be looked at because the police may or may not pick up an unlicensed premises, but the, creating a, a role of a, an officer on the council to deal with licensing issues and not giving them any powers to deal with unlicensed premises seems to me an obvious gap. OK. Um, if I can move on to um, ask you about how information is shared... Uh, between the Council's various licensing functions. Um, are there formal links in, in terms of your own Councils between the Licensing Board and the Licensing Committee? Mr Smith? Um, they are, they're both administered by the, the same team, so there's an underlying thing, does it, sometimes? Maybe administered by the same team, but... Uh, often within teams information is not shared. Do you think that uh, in Glasgow there is that sharing of information? Absolutely. At the, at the administrative level, um, I'm not sure if there may be specific examples that you, you could give me that. Um... I could probably give you numerous, but I won't, Mr Smith. Okay. Um, I, I'm just interested to hear what you have to say on this issue. Um, well, I think in terms of the, the administrative side of committees and boards, they, they will tend to be dealt with by teams which will be integrated to some extent. In Glasgow, it's a complete integration as one team, and that information is available to both those teams. Um, when you go out with that, I think in different local authorities, you do find very different setups in terms of enforcement teams, licensing standards teams. So a, a colleague Fred will explain it's quite an integrated model they have there. In Glasgow, our tax enforcement and licensing standards teams sit with an entirely separate service of the council. If we have civic officers, they will sit in an entirely different part of the council. Um, and we, we do have well-established links to share information, um, and we're continuing to, to make sure that that's um, improved as we go forward so that there is a, a level of joined-up thinking. But in essence, the administrative side of licensing will hold the information, and it's our responsibility to make sure that there are effective links to the enforcement teams to share that information and that there are also suitable links to external bodies such as Police Scotland to give them that information as well. Uh, one of the things which uh, we've heard from folks is that members of the public uh, will call and will be put from pillar to post, one person to another person to another person, um, to try and get a problem resolved. Uh, do you think that happens in Glasgow with the current situation that you have there? I think that will happen in every local authority, just given the, the, the structure of the, the licensing setup and the fact it deals with so many uh, disparate parts. Um, you know, licensing standards officers that deal with alcohol is a good example, especially when you bring a breakthrough into the mix. If someone has a problem about noise coming from a licensed premises, they may either contact the licensing board or contact licensing standards officers. In either case, they would eventually be directed to licensing standards officers. However, licensing standards officers um, within Glasgow then take the view that it's a noise issue and there's specific legislation to deal with noise, so that matter then has to be transferred to the, the noise team to deal with that, who would then deal with the noise issue, and then they may bring that back to licensing standards if they believe there's a licensing issue contained within the noise issue, and then that may come back to the board. So there certainly will be people directed pillar to post. It's a complicated system. 
and I think that standards officers in both liquor and civic are a good idea to give the public a single point of contact to engage with the process. But the reality is that moving from that, they will then possibly be directed elsewhere. If you contact, say, a civic enforcement officer about an issue with a late hours catering premises and it's a food complaint, then that issue will have to be transferred to environmental health to be investigated. So councils are, as you, you understand, large structures. And I think it's important about giving people single points of contact to come into those processes. But the reality is that sometimes they will then have to be directed elsewhere once they, they engage with the council. Do you not think that single point of contact should maybe be the liaison for the entire process and deal with the, um, the matter in a, a single uh, manner? I, I'll, I'll give you an example that we've had as a committee, and that's round about complaints uh, about sexual entertainment venues, um, where in some cases there have been licensing board uh, matters, licensing committee matters, and beyond that um, there have been advertising uh, matters which fall under the remit of the council as uh, as the planning authority. Uh, wouldn't it be much easier uh, in these circumstances if there was a single point of contact and that that single point of contact acted as the liaison to deal with that complaint? And maybe even further, uh, maybe it would be wise to bring um, uh, sexual entertainment venues, for example, in, under one regime, maybe under the licensing board rather than all of the rest of it. Do you have a view? I think that's entirely sensible. I think to achieve that, there is a requirement to, to ensure that that's within legislation and within the statutory guidance that goes on to, to support that legislation. Um, without that clear guidance, um, local authorities will not consistently take that view. Um, as I said, the, the enforcement teams within the Council don't sit within the licensing remit. So uh, even if I did perhaps share your view, um, it's the decision of an entirely separate part of the, the council to deal with um, complaints in the manner that they're dealt with. But I, I can certainly understand the frustration of a community who are engaging with a licensed standards officer, perhaps on a noise complaint, and then to be told that that has to be dealt with by the noise team. But without clear guidance on bright crew and without clear guidance on what a licensed standards officer should be doing with, for example, a noise complaint, which is going to be something which I imagine is dealt with fairly regularly across Scotland, there will be a, a difference of approach between councils, and that can certainly be addressed through, through guidance. Mr. Mitchell? I think across Scotland, different authorities will take different views. I mean, the part of the, the reason Edinburgh put all the licensing functions under one service grouping and one manager was to try and address some of the issues that you outlined, I would say honestly I think we are making progress but in terms of making it a, a streamlined system, I, I wouldn't say that we're all the way there yet I mean, adult entertainment and sexual entertainment is an interesting example I, mean, I would take the view that the adult entertainment provisions are fairly much redundant post break crew and what's happening is that certainly our experience in Edinburgh is that licensing standards officers are trying to manage a regime with very little powers to do so. So we we are one of these authorities who have had complaints about adverts and the impact of these types of premises on the community. And I can honestly say part of the reason why communities are probably frustrated is because there is very little powers, planning, trading standards, licensing or otherwise, to deal with those types of issues absent what has been proposed in the bill. Okay. Uh, that is extremely useful. I think one of the things um, is that the public often feel that they will contact somebody um, and uh, get very little response. What is commonly known as the, uh, in the North East as the slopey shoulder scenario. It's not my job. I'm, you know, I'll pass it on to somebody else. Um, okay. If we could maybe uh, move on um, and ask you. Oh, Claire, sorry, I didn't notice you. On you go. Just on that point, and, and um, whether you, you feel that the proposals in the bill will give any significant change to the way. Um, sexual entertainment is dealt with and whether you think the bringing together of the alcohol licence and sexual entertainment licence under one body to, to, to grant would actually help with some of the, the problems that you've experienced. Mr. 
I suppose I take a slightly different perspective from my colleague here. I think licensing boards are not suited to deal, to deal with these types of issues. Um, and the Edinburgh's view is that local authorities are best placed and welcome the provisions for sexual entertainment and the use of Schedule 2. It needs some updating, certainly, but it is certainly more effective than most other things that we have at present. So, so for example, Schedule 2 if that's where sexual entertainment go, goes into, allows you to control the form and content of adverts by means of condition, whether or not you can see into premises, those kind of issues. I, I think, I, I don't think myself that the adult entertainment provisions have been at all successful, and part of that is because I, I would suggest that boards are largely there to s regulate the sale of alcohol. They're not suited to deal with these wider community issues, but which is sort of my personal view. Be adapted, and why can't they do all? They, I, I suppose they could. I think it's a choice that the, the Parliament will have to make. I, I, our view is that local authorities, with that broader base of responsibilities, are more accountable to the community in that sense for sexual entertainment, and that's largely why we suggest that it should be part of a council function and leave the board to get on with licensing alcohol seems in terms of the evidence that we've taken that communities don't feel that councils have done what they need to do to deal with the issues that they have raised with councils. Well, certainly at present there is no powers uh, for councils. The, the creation of these, this new licensing scheme would for the first time give councils, as opposed to boards, the power to deal with these types of premises. Mr Smith, do you have a view on these issues? I do, yes. Um, I think we need one licensing authority. I don't think that there's really a need to have two distinct licensing authorities, a licensing committee and a licensing board. Um, in Glasgow, we have, we've, we've racked our brains for many years to understand why, why you have a licensing board, why it's not just one licensing function. I think the, the, the specific issue on alcohol and sexual entertainment venues, the, the reason we're having to implement sexual entertainment licensing is because of a, a decision within the alcohol bill, that this breakthrough decision, which really says that the bill is just about regulating the sale of alcohol and not the other activities. You don't have to implement sexual entertainment licensing if you fix breakthrough. If you create a, a license scheme which is dealing with not just the sale of alcohol, but a range of activities flowing from a premises, then you can easily regulate alcohol and sexual entertainment under one licensing scheme and under one licensing body. But it's coming back to the fact that the, the overall system is is just not right, and you would really have to go back to the, to, to the beginning and start again to create something which is singular and coherent. Um, th there's no real need to have two licensing bodies. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you. Can you, just on that point about the two licensing bodies, uh, I go back in previous evidence session, I had indicated that I served on a licensing board and the licensing committee of an authority because. They were basically two separate bodies, but and the same members on those two bodies. Uh, but one would make decisions on licensing applications, and one would make, say, for instance, private hire cars or taxi licenses. What would be the problem in bringing those two together? Uh, are there any problems in bringing these two together? Because my understanding is the licensing board was seen as a quasi-legal body whereas the committee was just seen as one of the additional committees of the council where the councillors could sit on those committees. So what would be the practical difficulties in terms of bringing all the licensing under one body, whether that be a licensing board or the licensing committee of an authority? In Aberdeen, both were deemed to be quasi-judicial. Uh, Mr Smith? We both are quasi-judicial. Um, I mean, I, I, Mr. Wilson's exact perspective, but I would imagine that you didn't treat an application for a, a private hire licence any different to the way you treated an, an application for alcohol. They were both considered against the same, not, not the same legal, but in the same way under legal frameworks. Um, I don't want to give an off-the-cuff answer just to say, no, it would be quite easy just to amalgam the two together. I think there were probably a lot of legal issues in, in the minutiae of things about how that would work. But I, I think as a, an overall concept, from a local authority perspective, it's quite unclear why we have two distinct licensing boards, a committee and a board dealing with 
two different aspects of licensing. If they were merged together into a single cohesive structure with the right regulatory framework around that, I think it would be a far, a far better model than what we have at the moment. I really feel the licensing board is just a very historical thing that's been kept, kept going for years and years and years. Okay, Mr. Mitchell. I think I probably have a quite similar perspective. I'm sure there's clerks of licensing board up and down the country, probably quite um, agitated at this point. But the the boards are a separate legal entity. Uh, they are, you know, have been for a number of years. For the practical purposes, it's the same council staff. Often, it's the same councillors who are dealing with both licensing board and, in our case, the regulatory committee and the licensing subcommittee. We do have a number of councillors who sit on both um, and at my experience it's not well understood by the public they think that the licensing board is just another council committee whereas in law it's not and the, the only I suppose practical difference of that is that whereas the council can formulate overall policy which committees sh should have regard to the licensing that doesn't impact the licensing board because it's entirely separate okay thank you very much um, one final question, um, and uh, that's round about second-hand dealers and metal de dealers. Obviously, the bill would remove some of the connections between the licensing requirement placed on second-hand dealers and metal dealers. Uh, do you have any concerns about that, Mr Smith? No, I think those, those specific aspects are, are well drafted. Um, they're not... I would go back to my underlying like, comments there. They're, they're trying to fix a system which is, is perhaps, for lack of a better word, broken. But those actual proposals in themselves, I think, uh, I don't really have any concerns about that. the interrelationship that those changes will make. Mr Mitchell? I certainly think the strengthening of the metal dealers provision is long overdue. I mean, there's some of the current aspects that, for example, if you're if you're a metal dealer above a certain financial threshold, you're then exempt from the requirement to obtain a licence. I've never quite understood how that particular section of the Act was set up in that particular way, so anything to strengthen that would be welcome. Very briefly, will I call Convener, I just wanted to ask the two members about their, their views on taxi driver licence applications. We had an example which was covered in the media where a person with a string of complaints and allegations made against them moved to the other authority and made an application for a tax driver's licence there without that knowledge being brought to to the table, how can we solve a, a problem like that, in your view? I shouldn't have said that finally before my last question. <laughs> uh, Mr Smith. Well, one of the pieces of work that the Glasgow has done over the last couple of um, years is to look at the integration of um, enforcement teams across uh, different local authorities to ensure that they are we're able to work in partnership with those authorities um, that we can tackle if a driver from uh, Renfrewshire comes into Glasgow, Glasgow's into Renfrewshire, there's an ability to deal with that. I think moving on from that piece of work, um, we do need to look at better information sharing between those processes. Obviously, the Civic Act is structured in such a way that um, the application will go to the police, and if it's a conviction or you know, even intelligence to, to some extent, but let's not go there, um, those issues can be brought to the, the committee. I think that there, there probably is a gap between um, concerns that one local authority enforcement team may have and how that gets passed to other local authorities. As we, we move forward with our integration piece and as we look at new technology solutions, we, we'll look to address that. Um, but I don't think that the, the, there really is a mechanism in place that's, that's going to address that problem right now. And to address it is about looking at cross-border enforcement of, of that sector and probably looking at uh, technical solutions along with that to ensure that that information can be shared. Um, albeit there, there may be challenges there if it's not convictions, if it's just um, matters which have been investigated by another local authority, th there would be questions about how much weight could be attached to that. But I think it would only be right and proper that as we move forward and as technology advances that we make sure that information is something that the local authorities have available to them when they're making those decisions in the future. Mr Mitchell, please. I think the move to single force has helped in some regard but there are still variances across the country that a police team may object in one part of the country and not object in another part of the country. We have a particularly high turnover of private hire car drivers and we are recognising a, a phenomenon of people who are coming from, say, England and Wales who have been refused licences by authorities down south who are then seeking almost a shopping round 
trying to obtain a private hire car driver's licence in the hope that somebody will give them a licence and they would then move to where that licensed work is. Um, I, I do think the local authority's powers in relation to private hire car drivers doesn't help. So, for example, if you're a taxi driver, because we can certainly we choose to put taxi drivers through an element of training, it somewhat discourages people who are not serious about moving to an area from doing that. But for because the powers currently in relation to private hire car drivers are relatively weak, it's you know we are recognising that as a particular problem. Thanks for that. Okay, thank you. And I thank you very much uh, for your evidence to. Uh, today, gentlemen, that's been very useful. Um, uh, and I suspend this meeting and we move into private session. Thank you.